The Sutra called Flawless Purity. A dialogue with the laywoman, Gangotara. Introduction. This short sutra from one of the oldest collections of the Mahayana Sutras, the Heap of Jewels, further explores the meaning of emptiness. If phenomena are empty of any essence, then the whole dualistic mind that wants to apprehend them as real, so as to possess or shun them, together with the world of apparently real things it creates, has really never come into existence. Fundamentally, it is unborn, yet it appears like a magic display. Since it is unborn, it also never dies. Here, that place beyond the grasp of the conceptual mind is referred to as nirvana. The setting of this sutra is in the Jetta Grove outside the city of Shravasti, north of the Ganges River in central India. This is the site of one of the first great monasteries built for the Buddha and his community, donated by the great patron Anatta Pindika. The seemingly fearless laywoman Gangotara, who obviously already has a superb grasp of the teachings, though tending toward the nihilistic side, is incisively interrogating the Buddha on his own ground. Though an unflinching debater, she addresses him respectfully as Tathagata and World Honored One. The Sutra called Flawless Purity. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling in the garden of Anatta Pindika, in the Jitta Grove near Shravasti. At that time, a laywoman named Gangotara came from her dwelling in Shravasti to see the Buddha. She prostrated herself with her head at the Buddha's feet, withdrew to one side, and sat down. The World Honored One asked Gangotara, Where do you come from? The laywoman asked the Buddha, World Honored One, if someone were to ask a magically produced being where he came from, how should the question be answered? The World Honored One told her, a magically produced being neither comes nor goes, is neither born nor perishes. How can one speak of a place from which he comes? Then the laywoman asked, Is it not true that all things are illusory, like magic? The Buddha said, Yes, indeed, what you say is true. Gangotara asked, If all things are illusory, like magic, why did you ask me where I came from? The World Honored One told her, A magically produced being does not go to the miserable planes of existence, nor to heaven, nor does he attain nirvana. Gangotara, is that also true of you? The laywoman replied, As I see it, if my own body were different from a magically produced one, then I could speak of going to the good and miserable planes of existence, or of attaining nirvana. I see no difference, though, between my body and a magically produced one. So how can I speak of going to the good or miserable planes, or of attaining nirvana? Furthermore, World Honored One, nirvana's very nature is such that it is not reborn in the good or miserable places, nor does it experience para-nirvana. I perceive that the same is true of my own nature. The Buddha asked, Do you not seek the state of nirvana? Gangotara asked in turn, If this question were put to one who had never come into being, how should it be answered? The Buddha replied, That which has never come into being is nirvana itself. Gangotara asked, Are not all things identical with nirvana? The Buddha replied, So they are, so they are. World Honored One, if all things are identical with nirvana, why did you ask me? Do you not seek the state of nirvana? Furthermore, World Honored One, if a magically produced being asked another magically produced being, do you not seek the state of nirvana? What would the answer be? The World Honored One told her, I raised the question, 
because there are in this assembly good people who can be brought to maturity. I am free of mental attachments. Why? Because the Tathagata knows that even the names of things inapprehensible, let alone the things themselves or those who seek nirvana. Gangotara said, If so, why all the accumulation of good roots for the attainment of enlightenment? The Buddha replied, Neither bodhisattvas nor their good roots can be apprehended, because in the bodhisattvas' minds there is no discriminative thought as to whether they are accumulating good roots or not. Gangotara asked, What do you mean by no discriminative thought? The world-honored one answered, The absence of discriminative thought cannot be understood or grasped by means of thinking. Why? Because in the state of non-discriminative thought, even the mind is inapprehensible, let alone the mental functions. This state in which the mind is inappreciable is called inconceivable. It cannot be grasped or realized. It is neither pure nor impure. Why so? Because, as the Tathagata always teaches, all things are as empty and unimpeded as space. Gangotara inquired, If all things are like empty space, why does the world-honored one speak of form, feeling, conception, impulse, and consciousness, the eighteen elements, the twelve entrances, the twelve links of dependent origination, the defiled and the undefiled, the pure and impure things, samsara and nirvana? The Buddha told Gangotara, When I speak of a self, for example, although I express the concept by a word, actually the nature of a self is inapprehensible. I speak of form, but the nature of form is also inapprehensible, and so it is with the other dharmas, or phenomena, up to nirvana. Just as we cannot find water in mirages, so we cannot find nature in form, and so it is with the others up to nirvana. Gangotara. Only a person who cultivates pure conduct in accordance with the Dharma, perceiving that nothing can be apprehended, deserves to be called a real cultivator of pure conduct. Since the arrogant say that they have apprehended something, they cannot be said to be firmly established in genuine pure conduct. Such arrogant people will be terrified and doubtful when they hear this profound Dharma. They will be unable to liberate themselves from birth, old age, sickness, death, worry, sorrow, suffering, and distress. Gangotara, after my parinirvana, there will be some people able to spread this profound dharma, which can stop the rounds of samsara. However, some fools, because of their evil views, will hate those dharma masters and will contrive to harm them. Such fools will fall to the hells for that. Gangotara asked, you speak of this profound dharma which can stop the rounds of samsara. What do you mean by stop the rounds of samsara? The world-honored one replied, To stop the rounds of samsara is to penetrate reality, the realm of the inconceivable. Such a dharma cannot be damaged or destroyed. Hence it is called the dharma that can stop the rounds of samsara. Then the world-honored one smiled graciously and emitted from his forehead blue, yellow, red, white, and crystalline lights. The lights illuminated all the numerous lands, reaching as high as the Brahma heaven, then returned to the Buddhas and entered the top of the Buddha's head. Seeing this, the venerable Ananda thought to himself, The Tathagata, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one, does not smile without a reason. He rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee and joined his palms toward the Buddha, inquiring, Why did the Buddha smile? The Buddha replied, Recall that, in the past, a thousand Tathagatas also taught this Dharma here, and each of those assemblies was also led by a laywoman named Gangotara. After hearing this Dharma preached, the laywoman and all the assembly left the household life. In time, they entered nirvana without residue. Ananda asked the Buddha, What name should be given to this sutra, and how should we accept and uphold it? 
The Buddha said, This sutra is called Flawless Purity, and you should accept and uphold it by that name. During the preaching of this sutra, 700 monks and 400 nuns were liberated from defilements forever, and their minds were set free. At that time, the gods of the realm of desire magically produced various kinds of wonderful celestial flowers and scattered them on the Buddha, saying, Rare indeed is this lay woman, who can converse fearlessly with the Tathagata on equal terms. She must have served and made offerings to countless Buddhas and planted good roots in their presence. After the Buddha had finished speaking this sutra, the laywoman, Gangotara, and all the other gods, humans, asuras, gandharvas, and so forth, were jubilant over the Buddha's teachings. They accepted it with faith and begun to follow it with veneration. By this merit, and by the intrinsic root of merit found throughout the three times, may all beings recognize the innate Buddhahood that pervades the three times and the fourth, so rarely found, and thereupon may all beings be liberated from the unfordable oceans of existence. May bodhicitta arise where it has not arisen, where it has arisen may it never decline but increase more and more. <laughs>